So let's prep for your real estate exam for national and for Texas state. So that's what we're doing today. National questions that I'll explain, point out keywords that'll help you answer the questions and I'll explain the answers should you end up missing it. So I ask that you participate and type the question number and the letter answer. And of course, then we'll do state, Texas state questions at the end. So the beginning of the class uh, applies to all 50 states. Anyone watching the replay, hey, go ahead and fast forward in between questions. If it's a little too slow for you, the class is designed to allow students to participate during the live. Hi, Jaylene. Thanks for checking in on me. Um, I'm still a little under the weather, not back up to par. However, um, I'm improving. Lots of rest, lots of water. Okay. And uh, so hanging in there. So I'm here for tonight. Can't be without you all very long. Okay. So thank you for your patience on Monday. Okie dokie. So here we go. All right, so we're starting out with 536, and these are the national questions, okay? And uh, Section 5 has to do with brokerage business and sales contracts. And on the state, we'll be dealing with sell contracts, co sell contracts. All right, so you all know you had experienced me having the sniffles for the last couple of weeks and sneezing, so uh, it caught up with me. Hey, Cindy. Hi, glad you're feeling a bit better. Yeah, thank you so much. It's going around. Some of my realtors' kids also have it. All right. So several buyers are competing for the last available home in a desirable new subdivision. One buyer calls the owner developer directly on the phone and offers $20,000 over and above the listed price. The developer accepts the offer. So at this point, what? Uh, oh my gosh, uh, uh, one of my students is calling, sorry. Hey, Carlos, I'm already live. You have to click the link on the, uh, on the YouTube. Okay. All right. Okay. See you in the class. Thank you. Yes, no, thank you. Okay. You all, sorry. It's not supposed to, my phone is on do not disturb, but the computer isn't, I guess. All right. And that's a Google voice number, which is a free number that you can apply for once you become a realtor and you want to use a marketing number. They say they don't recommend that you use a Google voice number. So if you have a Gmail account, you can uh, apply for a Google voice number and forward it to your personal cell number. And uh, it's free. I've been using it since 2014, have never had any issues. But of course, you know, it's on the it's an Internet phone line that is free. One Google voice number per uh, email address. So I have two phones, two major emails, one Google voice for each one for San Antonio and one for um, the Rio Grande Valley. So hi, Anna. Hi, Lizbeth. Okay, so the answer here is 36B. I haven't said the answers, but the parties have a valid enforceable sale contract on the home. B, the parties have completed a verbal executory contract. C, the parties may not cancel their contract. Or D, the developer could not entertain other offers on the property. So it says several buyers are competing for the last home in a subdivision, desirable, so high demand not enough supply. So one buyer calls the developer directly on the phone, offers 20,000 over and above the listed price. The developer accepts the offer. So the developer has accepted a verbal offer, right? So at this point, B, the parties have completed a verbal executory contract. Okay, so then they'll put it in writing and send it to the title company escrow, or it's closed there at the developer's subdivision you know they can bring in an escrow officer and also a lender to help out with the process so yes the answer is 536 b all right so let's see who is on uh facebook so for anyone that's on facebook go to streamyard.com forward slash facebook 
and give StreamYard permission to post your name, all right, on Facebook. Hi, Jocelyn. So go to this website, okay? And who is it, Jocelyn, and who else is on here? Hmm, I don't know, it says two individuals. Hi, Gina, thanks for joining us. You're very welcome. Just my energy is not as high as usual because I'm not feeling as well. Um, however, hey, I uh, didn't want to miss another day. It impacts you and it impacts my YouTube analytics. Okay. All right. So anybody on Facebook, uh, go to this page, streamyard.com forward slash Facebook so that we do not see you as just Facebook but as Gina or Jaylene, okay, or Lizbeth, we will actually get to see who you are. Okay, so um, I did type the answer, 536. So my focus isn't as great also, so just uh, be patient with me, bear with me. Those watching the replay, hey, just fast forward. Number 37. An owner completes a sales contract on her property with a buyer. Okay, so owner completes a sales contract on her property with a buyer. Before closing, the seller runs into financial trouble and assigns the contract to her principal creditor. Ooh, uh, loan number one. The buyer cries foul, fearing the property will be lost. Which of the following is true? A, the buyer can sue the assignee to disallow the illegal assignment. B, the buyer can take legal action against the assignor. C, the assigner has completed a legal action. Or D, the sale contract is nullified. So the buyer cries foul, fearing the property will be lost. So which of the following is true? So the owner... Okay, signs a completes a contract, okay, with the buyer. However, they're having financial difficulty with the lender. So the seller runs into, uh, assigns a contract to her principal creditor. Okay, that creditor can sell it. Hi, Carlos, good to see you on here. Welcome to our YouTube agent prep. And, um, okay, so where am I? Okay, so the answer here is C. The assigner has completed a legal action, okay? Because they're in financial trouble. So they assign the contract to the lender, which it is legal to assign a contract to somebody else. Uh, 37D. No, it is not D. The sale contract is not nullified when it is assigned. Okay. Contracts are assignable to someone else. Okay. That is legal. And that new assignee can follow through with the closing. The buyer will still be able, okay, to purchase the property. Okay, as long as the lender, you know, it was assigned to the lender, the lender can continue to sell it, right, and prevent a foreclosure and a lot more cost. So basically what the owner is doing, they're doing like a deed in lieu of foreclosure. So they're assigning the deed back to the lender. They don't say that on here, but they assign the contract, which is already an agreeable contract between the seller and the buyer. And either party can assign their contract to someone else, to a third party. Okay, so what it, oh, I'm sorry, I typed the wrong answer. I tell you, you guys don't have to keep an eye, uh, an eye alert on me, okay? Because the fact that I'm not feeling so well is interfering with <laughs> my clarity, okay? So let's see, somebody answered, um, no, that was it. Oh, someone answered, be the buyer can take legal action against the assigner. No, it is allowed, okay? 
So no leg legal action required here. So either party of a sale transaction can assign the sale contract to another party subject to the provisions and conditions contained in the agreement. So the assignee must follow the contract, okay? And perform. Hi, Ruth. I'm feeling a little better, still not up to par. Thank you for asking. I appreciate uh, everybody's comments um, when I posted that I was canceling Monday, which I hate it doing. It's just, uh, anyway, it's that season of the year, right? Where some of us get sick. When we overdo it, we overexert ourselves with working and exercising, uh, it can happen. And it did happen. Okay, number 38. A due on sale clause in a sales contract puts parties on notice that what? A, the full price of the property is due the seller at closing. B, any loan surviving closing becomes immediately payable. C, all of the seller's debts must be retired before or upon closing. Or D, any co conveyance may trigger an acceleration of any loan secured by the property. So due on sale clause. It's a clause that is in uh, actually on the deed of trust when you have a mortgage. And so it also in a sale of contract, it puts the parties on notice. So if the borrower is conveying the property without informing the lender. Okay. There are uh, exceptions where it can be done legally. However, in this case, they didn't contact the lender. Doesn't specifically say, say that, but it's implied. A do on sale clause in a sale contract put parties on notice that A, the full price of the property is due to seller at closing any loan surviving closing becomes immediately payable. So all the seller's debts must be retired. And no, the answer is D, any conveyance. So any transfer, any sale, okay, may trigger. So the key word is also may, it doesn't say it will. May trigger an acceleration. That means pay me now. Okay, I want my money now of any loan secured by the property, the property that is uh, on a sale contract put for sale. Okay, so we've got some new individuals here. Hi, Michael. Thanks for joining us. Shadow Dark. Hey, this is an interesting game, right? Uh, Shadow, something like that, Dark. Uh, Sarah Munoz, just logging on. So, hey, thank you all for joining us and we are doing, I should say on here, national uh, questions, okay? So number 38 is D, any conveyance means any transfer. So that's what a do on sale clause is. If, if the owner of that property that has a loan, they have a lender's lien, a, a lender's lien, right? A vendor's lien, that is on the deed that is and on the deed of trust. Therefore, the do on sale clause says, hey, if you decide to sell that property or transfer it to somebody else, we may call that note due now. That is acceleration. But it doesn't mean that they will. OK. There are ways to uh, avoid that. Did I type the answer? Yes, I did. Thank you all for your concern. And I'm, I am getting better slowly, but surely. Lots of water, lots of sleeping. Okay. I did do a little bit of walking today with my neighbor's dog because I borrow her every day. Okay, so she doesn't stay alone. Okay, 538D. All right, number 39, a tenant has an option to purchase agreement with the landlord, okay? So an option to purchase agreement. So it becomes like a unilateral contract, right? A one-way contract agreement. 
And so that's when somebody wants to buy a property, then they have to lease it with the landlord. That expires June 30th. On July 1st, the tenant frantically calls the landlord to exercise the option, offering the apology that she was busy with a death in the family. Which of the following is true? Time is of the essence on these option periods, right? A, since options contain grace periods, the landlord must sell. B, the tenant loses the right to buy, but can't claim the money paid for the option from the landlord. C, the landlord does not have to sell, but must renew the option. Or D, the option is expired and the tenant has no rightful claim to money paid for the option. So it's like the option in a sales contract, right? An option to do all the inspections. So this is a tenant, okay, wanted to buy the property, they're leasing it. So there's a lease agreement, there's a purchase agreement, and then there's an option agreement. So what happens when the deadline was June 30th and they came on July 1st? Oh, so sorry, you know, I had so many things going on and blah, blah, blah. Well, time is of the essence. What does that mean? Yes, Gina, I am going to do state today, okay, on the second half of class. So the answer is D. That's correct, Shadow, and uh, who else answered D? Facebook user um, and Cindy, Sarah. So who's the Facebook user? Monica. Hi, Monica. All right. So the answer is D. The option expired, right? It expired June 30th. So excuses are not acceptable. And the tenant has no rightful claim to money paid for the option. The option could have been, you know, $5,000, $3,000, that type of thing. It's not a down payment. It's an option fee to hold that lease agree that option to purchase agreement for a future date should they want to exercise it. That future date was June 30th. Exercised it too late. Okay, so Facebook user... Uh, uh, please go to uh, this website really quick and you can give StreamYard permission to post your name on StreamYard and that uh, your Facebook name because Facebook is very protective of our accounts. And so you'll be able to see like Anna Camp, Gina, okay, Cindy, Michael, Sarah, instead of just saying Facebook user. That way we all know who is here. And actually, I would prefer if you would go to the YouTube channel to watch the video, okay, and um, help me with my watch hours. Okay, thank you, Miss Lily, uh, for still being here teaching. I appreciate it, Anna. Hey, and Anna is a bodybuilder. And, you know, one of the reasons why I got sick because I went five days to the gym, four days in a row, took one day off, another. And when I go, I work out hard. Okay. Well, we have to pace ourselves when we're just getting back into it two months ago. So thank you. So, yeah, I'm... Uh, an exercise person. I've been bodybuilding, weight training, exercising, you name it, anything, high energy me uh, most of my life, actually all my life. You know, took off sometimes. And sometimes we overdo it. And if we're not careful, we'll get sick. And that will happen in real estate also. Okay. And so we need to pace ourselves and listen to our bodies and give our time you know, set boundaries for ourselves in our business, in our personal life, in our physical life so that we can continue working, right? Because this is our business that we opened a door for. All right, number 40. Okay. Two parties enter into a contract for deed contract for deed agreement, okay? In this form of agreement, A, title is conveyed to the buyer, but the seller retains possession of a stipulated time period. B, the buyer contracts to pay all cash at closing in exchange for the deed. 
C, the seller retains legal title while the buyer makes partial payments until the contract is fully executed. D, the buyer immediately acquires legal title and takes possession. So contract for deed. Okay. So that is like a land contract. Contract for deed. So you're signing a contract in exchange for the deed, but what has to happen first before you get that deed? Or before they get that deed? So type your answer in the chat. So far I have CC. CC, monsieur. And yes, the answer is C. The seller retains legal title while the buyer makes partial payments until the contract is fully executed. Okay, when it's fully executed, it means it closed, right? We execute a contract, so the agreement between buyer and, and seller closed, came to a closing, right? They agreed, so the contract is executed. Then it goes to the escrow officer or attorney or title company and that contract is executory. Once it closes, that transaction has been fully executed. Here, once they make all their amortized payments, then it's totally um, executed and the seller conveys the legal title by signing the warranty deed, right? Hey, Monica, you did it. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Number 41. The federal law that produced the do not call list and related protection is referred to as the A, Solicitation Regulations Act, B, Telemarketing Prohibition Act, C, CANSPAN Act, or D, Telephone Consumer Protection Act. So while you think about it and type the answer, I'm taking a sip, many sips. So you will deal, once you become a realtor, you're going to deal with the do not call list that we are not, we can be fined up to $10,000 for calling someone that is on the do not call list should they report us. And it has happened to some realtors that do cold calling and um, either we're not aware or disregarded and keep calling. Because you know, many of us are probably signed up with the do not call list, but we still get lots of spam call. I have four phone numbers signed up with the do not call list, right? Two Google voice numbers and two regular phone numbers. I still get lots of spam calls. So the answer is D, Telephone Consumer Protection Act. So y'all got it right. Well, let's see. Michael answered C, Lisbeth A. You know, you would think it is the um, solicitation or telemarketing prohibition, um, but it's it's protecting whom? The consumer. So Consumer Protection Act, that's what a lot of these acts or policies are created for, is to protect the consumer. Therefore, Telephone Consumer Protection Act versus Solicitation Regulations Act or telemarketing. Telemarketing, you know, is allowed, but when somebody signs up for the do not call list, then our phone numbers are registered and individuals can purchase the do not call list and be totally aware. Should you ever become uh, a cold calling realtor, you will buy uh, a client list or a prospect list from certain companies and they will identify those individuals that are on the do not call list so that we don't call them. However, as I mentioned, some will still do it and take the risk. 
uh, the risk could come to be ten thousand dollars. All right, number forty-two. So let's see. So would the prospect list would show their names? Uh, yes. The the um, lead generating systems where we buy leads, okay, it will have the prospects' names and their phone numbers and emails, depending on how much we pay for it. If we can pay for a lead generating system that um, also has a phone dialer, so that you it'll dial through a series of phone numbers. And when somebody answers, it lets you know, you know, you'll be ha having your headsets on and it'll list all the individuals that could be potential buyers that if they clicked on a website or, you know, any type of uh, home buying, selling websites, it'll pick up their information and then they sell those leads. Okay. Oh, so you just answered the question. Oh, yes. Okay. So a lot of these generating tools, generating systems, there's the whole bunch of them out there. Uh, one of them is actually called, I think, Mojo. And, you know, we'll pay a monthly fee for it and we'll get daily leads. Could be for sale by owners or expireds. Okay. And the expireds, of course, they get them from the MLS and they have a syndication with the MLS multiple listing service and lots of different home buyer websites for sale by owner websites. They'll, you know, they'll grab their information from there. They'll scrub them and they'll put do not call list. It'll be on a spreadsheet and you'll know which ones not to call. And if they ask you when you do call, Hey, don't call me again. Good. They didn't report you, but somebody might. And so some of these systems, you can buy the dialing, the phone dialing system. So it'll start, you can get a one dialer, two dialer, three dialers, four dollars, depending how quick, how good you are at answering calls. And that way you go through a whole no amount of um, prospects in a short time and get your 20 to 30 or 40 calls a day and hopefully touch at least 20 of them. And when I mean touch, means you actually spoke with that amount of individuals. All right, uh, 42. New federal regulation in advertising requires email advertisers to give recipients an option to discontinue receiving emails from such advertisers. This legislation is called A, the Can Spam Act, B, the Truth in Advertising Act, C, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, or D, the email protect advising, the email advertising Pro prohibition act. Oh, it is not D. I would take another attempt at it. So let's see, what would be a keyword here? So new federal regulation in advertising requires email advertisers to give recipients an option to discontinue from such. The legislation is called, what do we get a lot of? Spam calls, spam emails, spam ads, right? And then we have to pay to get rid of those ads. So it is actually A the can spam act and so the can spam act bans unwanted commercial messages sent to wireless devices require prior authorization for transmit certain messages and requires an opt-out provision where the receiver can shut off the advertiser from sending future messages so you'll notice when you get a text message it say it says reply stop or for opt out you know, press one or type one. So we can opt out for those. But we can spend a lot of time during the day opting out on a lot of these. So they are can spam. So they are, you know, what can, canned uh, messages, right? Canned messages means they 
uh, memorize certain messages. And uh, so it was established, I think, in the SPAM Act in 2003, controlling the assault of non-solicited oh, pornography and marketing. So it, the CAN, C-A-N, stands for Controlling the Assault of Non-Solicited Pornography and Marketing Act is law passed 2003, establishing the United States' first national standards for the sending of commercial email. And now it's also text messages. So I just Google it real quick, okay? Google is one of my best friends besides uh, the gym. Huh, that's strange. Oh, check this out. The answer typed on, on the book, if any of you have the book, it typed 542C, but the answer is the Can Spam Act. All right, so C was the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, but this was for email advertisers, right? Not for uh, phone calls. We did the phone call on the question before. So sometimes the books uh, type incorrect answers. They may explain the answer correctly, but type the wrong letter answer. So keep an eye out for things like that. Teachers do it too. Tutors do it too. So good thing I didn't type C, right? All right, now we're going to economics. So that was the end of uh, what were we on standards and contracts. So test number five, oh, what the heck happened here? Oh, come on, don't freeze on me. It's misbehaving. These are other books that I read, okay? Okay, it's misbehaving here. Uh, okay, so what I was trying to do is look at the three lines. So we just finished... Uh, Test number five, which was on brokerage business and sales contracts. So now we're starting with economics and appraisal. So the economics, what supply and demand of society, of the economy. All right, so number 6.1. If the price of an item is increasing, Prices go up. One can usually assume that what? A, demand for the item is decreasing in relation to supply of the item. B, demand of the item is increasing in relation to the supply of the item. C, supply of the item is increasing. D, demand for the item and supply of the item, and item are increasing. So it's usually a titter-totter. Supply and demand. Supply goes up. Demand goes down. Okay, supply goes down, demand goes up. So it's not D. Oh, so Cindy chose D. It is not D, Cindy. Because supply and demand go opposite directions, okay? So it says, if the price of an item is increasing, does that mean there's an abundance of them or there's not enough? So come Christmas time, if your kid wants a, a particular robot or a particular doll and there aren't enough of them, there's all people out there selling them for much more money, right? So what does that mean? The demand for the item is increasing in relation to the supply for the item. So there's a lower supply and a higher demand for the item. Okay, so... Less robot, man, people are going to be rushing. I've seen it on Christmas movies. They're rushing to the store to get that robot and are willing to pay a lot more money to get that robot for their son or the favorite doll or 
whatever toy it might be. Okay. The answer is B. And I'll explain it a little bit. Okay. So it says the price of an item is increasing. So that means there's a demand for it. When there's a demand for an item and there's not enough of them out there, then the price increases, the demand, and the price increases because there's a higher demand and there's not enough to go around. Okay, now our, our um, okay, so some of you meant B instead of uh, A. All right, so, you know, gas prices went up, right? But that was the, uh, the change of the economy. Sometimes it's, it happens because of fear, not because there's not enough fuel. And so now we're back down here in uh, San Antonio. It had gone up to like five dollars. OK, now it's back down to upper twos or low threes. So it wasn't so much because the fuel wasn't available it's because of the fear of you know wars happening in other countries. It affects the um, the market, the interest rate, the index, um, supply and demand of certain things and uh, interest rates gone up. So the supply of homes available is greater, not enough buyers, okay? So interest rates went up, buyers don't wanna buy as much, yet still are, sellers still wanna sell. So in that case, the pricing of the homes go down because the interest rates went up, which means it costs the buyer more money to buy the same house Seller still wants to sell it, so they start dropping the price if they want to sell or they wait till the market turns around in a few years. Because the market doesn't turn around just like in a year. It takes several years, seven, five to ten years. Usually the average is seven years. The market will oscillate, go up and then down. So it starts going up for seven years, which is a peak. Then it starts going down for another seven years and re it reaches the bottom. And sometimes it can be 10 years. All right, here's a uh, comment or question. I haven't been able to answer because for some reason the big, the page is blurry. Okay, the reason why your page is blurry, Anna, is on your end. So you're watching on YouTube. So on YouTube, when you have the video on, okay, you need to... The, the blurriness, it's on your end and not on mine. You have to change the resolution. So let me show you really quick how to fix that. Okay, so here's the YouTube video that's on right now. Okay, the live. So you see when, when you move your, your mouse to the screen, you'll see this menu in the bottom. Okay, so you've got to hit the gear. When you hit the gear, you see uh, quality and you see how mine is set to auto and it's 720p. If yours is lower, 140, 360, you'll see it blurry. So you want to go to a quality resolution of 720 in order to be able to see a clear screen on, at your end. I a lot of times have to do it at my end too. All right. Okay. What about the supply demand increasing? Okay. When there's a greater demand for a supply of something, okay, then the, um, the pricing will go up. So we just passed through a market where there was a big uh, demand for housing. There was not enough of a supply. Okay, so you're saying the, the, the supply demand. So there was a demand for supply. So the demand increased, not so much the supply. So the demand increased, okay, according to what you're saying here. So the supply and demand don't increase at the same time. It's going one or the other. So when the demand increases, then there could be not enough of a supply. So then pricing, uh, uh, pricing can start to increase when there's a big demand. 
And while our interest rates were low, we had a high demand for housing. So sellers were almost getting, you know, tons of multiple offers and getting way above what the list price was because there were not enough homes on the market. Okay, the supply was finishing really fast within a month if, if no new listings were being uh, added. So the price of the housing went up and the interest rates were low. They were down below three or three and a quarter. Well, now the interest rates have gone to six and a third. So there's not enough of a, a demand for those houses, even though there still is a supply of homes. So what happens? The, the prices of the homes starts to decrease because the demand for homes uh, decreases and there's enough supply, not enough buyers. So it, it titter totters, okay? When one goes up, the other goes down. Okay, so you got it. I think I got it now. All right. Oh, okay, yeah, you've got the resolution. Sounds good. So six one is B. So the item, the price was increasing. Okay. So that robot is increasing or the car is increasing. Why? There's a big demand for it, right? A new car is being introduced. Everybody wants it, right? All those uh, hot, uh, hot car fanatics want it. Well, they're willing to pay more for that, for that car because there aren't enough around and they want to be the first ones to get it, right? or a woman that there's a new uh, dress design, okay? They wanna get it. They wanna be the only one wearing it. They're willing to pay a higher price for it. Got it? All right. That's supply and demand, the economy. It's impacted by the economy. All right, number two, 6.2. .2. When the market for an item has achieved market equilibrium, so, okay? It's kind of balanced, right? So you've got the scale, the scale are at equilibrium. Okay, they're equal. Which of the following statements is true? A, new suppliers will enter the market and drive the price down. B, the demand will slowly taper off, driving the price down. C, unmet demand for the item is directed towards demand for some other item. Or D, Supply and demand are equal and price and value are equal. So remember, I said typically the supply and the demand are opposite. One's up, one's lower. However, here it says it's at equilibrium. The scales are balanced. Okay, they're equal. So what would that mean? All right, Sarah, enjoy the replay. All right, so I've got 6.2D, D, and yes, the answer is D. The supply and demand are equal, therefore price and value are equal. Very good. It's like when your ears, you have an ear infection, your equilibrium is off, so you'll start shifting to one side, losing your balance to the other side. So it, it you know, you go off balance. So here they're balanced. So 6.2D, very good. Number three. As an economic product, real estate is distinguished by what? A, it's homogeneity, homogeneity or homogeneity, B, it's variety, C, it's uniqueness of every parcel, or D, it's ability to appreciate in value. Econ as an economic product, real estate is distinguished by how do you distinguish one piece from another? These are char physical, character physical characteristics, right? Yes, the answer is C, the uniqueness of every parcel.
They are each individually different. They're not homo homogeneity, homogeneous, right? So it says here, in comparison with other economic products and services, real estate has certain unique traits. Traits of real estate include inherent product value, uniqueness of every single property, every single lot. Demand must come to the supply. And then illiquidity, slow to respond to changes and a decentralized local market. So it's not always easily to convert your your res, um, real estate to cash, right? It'll take some some time. So the liquidity takes time. It depends on the demand uh, for that real estate. So even though houses might be identical, the land itself, the the earth below it is unique. Every lot is unique. That's why they have surveys and they take measurements, okay? Each one is unique. There might be a little curve in the front of the lot. You know, you've got the curb and gutter and uh, the street. So every piece of land is unique. And underneath, you know, there may be, you know, the land has, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, God, I can't remember. There's really good water that's underneath. There are plates that move according to the earth, right? It can cause uh, earthquakes or can cause tsunamis. So every piece is unique. All right, number... So that was 63C, number 64. Not 64, 6.4. So you all, be, you know, bear with me. I am a little bit slower than normal today. So number 6.4, the city of Stephenville has declared a moratorium on the new construction. If demand is increasing, what will the likely effect on real estate prices in the area B. So what will be the likely effect on real estate prices when the demand is increasing? A, prices level off. B, prices continue to follow the trend that preceded the moratorium. C, prices fall. Or D, prices rise. So demand is increasing. Okay, on a new construction, what likely happens to the price? The price will rise. The answer is D, prices will rise. It will not continue to follow the trend that pre preceded the moratorium. Okay, so supply and demand. So they have just declared a moratorium on new construction. Demand is increasing. That'll cause prices to increase because there probably won't be enough homes. So those of you that answer B or yeah, mainly B. Yeah, the answer is actually the prices increase, okay? Uh, I thought that was because they stopped new construction. No. Okay, so they have declared, okay, a moratorium on new construction. So if there isn't enough construction... Okay, that's a temporary re, uh, stop on construction. Then people are going to want buy whatever's left, and they want to beat everybody else, so they're going to pay more for it, right? All right, number five. So when they're when they're putting a stop to new construction, now you know people are moving, people want to buy. And probably interest rates are still good. And even if they're not, people are still going to buy. 
So that'll cause the prices to go up in the area unless they decide to move somewhere else. But the question had to do with buying in the area. Okay, number five. If Okapi Inc., a company that markets its sports clothing worldwide, moves into Stevensville and hires 100 employees, it is reasonable to expect that the town will experience what? So you got movement coming into town, right, because of a new employer, lots of jobs. A, an immediate rise in the demand for industrial real estate, but no changes in the real estate market. B, an increase in demand for all types of real estate. C, a housing boom, but no other changes in the real estate market. Or D, an immediate increase in the prices for industrial and office real estate, but no impact on the residential market. So company marketing markets sports clothing worldwide, moves to Stephenville, hires 100 employees, so more money coming into individuals, right? More buying power. So it's reasonable to expect that the town will experience what? So it's a sports clothing uh markets it's sports clothing worldwide so it's selling it all over the world so what what things do you use sports clothing for what could what else could it attract if you have more people in the area or more money more buying power in the area okay so the answer here is b an increase in demand for all types of real estate because right? there may be other uh, companies, okay, that want to supply product to those employees. So those employees may be buying housing. Uh, then they might be buying, wanting to buy cars, motorcycles, other toys, uh, other sports equipment, you know, for boating or fishing. So other commercial real estate can also sell. So you'll probably have uh, renting, okay, residential, commercial, maybe other industrial. Not sure about agriculture, depends on whether Stevensville has that kind, but it's for all types of real estate. Well, you could actually have land, right? And then, um, grow fish right and supply it with fish so fishermen can come buy the clothing and then go fishing fishermen and women okay there are some uh, uh famous fish women fishermen fisher women okay we're gonna call it a day on national right now um and we're going to move to texas state my energy is running running low really quick okay so i apologize uh, but we did probably i don't know 15 national questions okay so let me transition into state Any questions before we transition? So we are going into 15.1. So we will be starting out with a section on contracts. All right. All right. 
right, any questions? So we're shifting to Texas State. I don't see any questions on Facebook or on YouTube. So for anybody who this is your first time, okay, visiting my channel to YouTube Agent Prep, hey, remember to, you know what to do, tap that subscribe button, click that little bell so you're notified every time I go live and click the thumbs up, right? Send me some love and let me know that you like what I'm uh, uh, tutoring or make some suggestions, okay? And I do read every comment that's posted even when the, there are crazy comments about other people recommending other teachers who I don't know. So when you all are seeing a, a lot of comments, right, right instantly, one right after the other, sometimes there's 15, 20, 30, 40, up to 50 of them right away from different people recommending these other teachers, okay? And saying, hey, uh, go to my WhatsApp. Hey, go to this link. Hey, uh, message me here. Please do not do that those are scammers spammers that youtube is trying to stop it's just a lot of them i used to delete them i now leave them because they actually help my channel right they're actually providing activity however i do warn all of you to disregard a lot of those crazy comments on there and i think anna or somebody else i've seen uh, you know, give them thanks, which at some point I did also because I didn't realize that they were spammers. But then I see the same names with the exact same comments. Okay. So beware. Students beware, not buyers. Be well, also buyers beware because you might be wanting to buy something from them. So I say, please don't. Follow the traditional, don't follow that, you know, carrot or it's greener on the other side of the field, okay? Because it isn't always the case. All right, Texas State questions. We're on contracts. Number one, which of the following is true regarding Texas promulgated contracts? A, they are recommended by the Texas Bar at the discretion of member attorneys. B, they must be completed with the assistance of approval or approval of a licensed attorney. C, they replace contracts previously prepared by principals, attorneys, or D, they must be used for sale and lease contracts, uh, transactions with some exceptions. So you took a whole 30 hours, okay, with contracts. All right, so far I've got D as an answer. And hey, DB Fitness, thanks for joining us. Yes, the answer is D. Okay, they must be used for sale and lease transactions with some exceptions. And that's, you know, residential, commercial, new construction, an improved property industrial, uh, condos, okay? Oh my gosh, I put 6.1D. So it's actually 15. Where did I come up with 6.1D? I have no idea. Okay, 15.1D. It says, DB it says, thank you for going live with us when you don't feel 100%. You're very welcome. I I appreciate you all for also being here, okay, and following me and uh, supporting my channel and hopefully enjoying what I provide that it helps you pass your exams because that's my goal. That's what I want all of you to do is pass your exams and don't be hard on yourself if for some reason you do not pass. I won't say fail because we are not failures. We just learn. You're very welcome, Cindy. All right. Number two, licensees may not engage in the unauthorized practice of law. Which of the following would constitute such a violation? 
Okay, so licensees may not engage in unauthorized practice of law. So which of the following choices is a practice, is a violation? A, insisting that due to the legal nature of the property transaction, the buyer should obtain competent legal counsel. B, explaining the purpose of a building permit. C, expressing an opinion regarding the validity of a seller's title. Or D, giving a buyer prospect a copy of a subdivision's covenants and restrictions. It is not D. Hi, Angela. Thanks for joining us. And yes, I thank you for appreciating me. I appreciate all of you too. Because, you know, this is a two-way street. I could be doing this and nobody attends. That wouldn't be real happy. I wouldn't be real happy about that. Um, the answer is C. Okay. Expressing an opinion regarding the validity of a seller's title. Okay, that is a legal document that is for attorneys to review with a prospect or with a client. That's the what the legal title, the seller's title, in case they want to sell their property or they just want to know, you know, what's on that title report. We leave that up to an attorney or send them to a title company and they can. They, they have their own attorneys, but usually that's not what they're there for, right? So they'll probably tell them, yeah, go ahead and go to a, an attorney. Where am I? Let's see. All right. So remember also, um, uh, whatchamacallit, title companies and escrow hour uh, escrow officers, they're a neutral uh, third party, right? Getting paid by, both by the buyer and the seller whenever there's a transaction to close. And they follow the instructions of the contract or any addendums or exhibits that are in writing and signed by both parties as additional instructions to the contract. All right, number... Um, Number three, let's see, what did some in individuals answer? Okay, well, everybody answered uh, C, O, oh, D. Uh, D, giving a buyer prospect a copy of a subdivision's covenant. No, that is not one. That's public information that can be obtained. Sometimes you may have to pay for it. So it can be obtained from the uh, HOA, from a title company if there's been properties that have closed but typically there will be a charge for those covenants and restrictions because there's usually a lot of sheets of papers but that is public information that those developers okay from subdivision owners um, must disclose because they want to restrict uh, above and beyond the zoning restrictions, okay, they have additional deed restrictions are called, right? Subdivision covenants and restrictions, deed restrictions. They want a four bedroom house, three bathrooms, two story brick, sidewalks, two car garage, fenced, okay? And if someone is buying a lot and it doesn't meet those requirements on what they built, they will not be allowed to purchase there. So you will learn about that once you get into the real world. All right, number number three. The practice of completing sales contract is tightly regulated activity since so much is at stake for consumers. Yes, it's an emotional, emo, emotional purchase or sale in the context or a fun investment. In that context, which of the following is not an acceptable practice? A. Filling in the blanks to a contract form in the middle of negotiations. B, adding a statement of fact desired by both principles. C, adding another blank in a contract clause. Or it's D, informing a buyer client that an encumbrance on seller's title may be a big problem for the lender. So which one is not an acceptable practice? Type your answer in the chat. All right. Okay. So far I have A, 
No, A is not correct. We That is what we do. We fill in the blanks to a contract, okay, to contract forms in the middle of negotiation if there's an, an amendment or something. So that is acceptable. We're filling in the blanks, okay? We're not writing any additional context or text, okay, or clauses to any document. And let's see. Uh, D, informing a buyer that an encumbrance so what's an encumbrance, right? It's an it's a cloud on seller's title. Yeah, that may be a big problem for the lender. Okay, the lender may not want to loan on a property that has uh, an encroachment, has other uh, liens on it. No, so that is okay. Informing a buyer that there is an encumbrance on the seller's title. So there may be a lien on the seller's title or on the deed. And uh, the lender may say, well, you know what? I don't want that issue. Or there is a, uh, a boundary line issue with the fencing or an encroachment of a building. Um, there is an unrecorded easement. Okay, different things like that. That'll create an issue for the lender. And that shows up in the title. So we're not translating, okay, the title. So the buyer client, uh, the realtor may have been informed by the title company, okay, hey, it says this is what the title policy says, the title, the search that we did on this property, this is what surfaced, okay? So the answer is C. Adding another blank in a contract clause, no, we can't do that we're then modifying that clause that we cannot do if we're filling a blank within that contract clause that's okay that's like a filling in blanks to a contract so it says here adding a blank into a contract is tantamount by practicing uh is equal to something to practicing law and is illegal but oh, wait a minute uh I mean, that's an, a not acceptable. That's what I meant. Not an acceptable practice. So that is illegal. Blanks may be at any time filled by licensees. That's what we do. We ask our clients questions that are on the contract and we fill them in. And, uh, and statements of fact can be added as requested by buyer and seller. So in the special omissions, uh, special provisions, right? So that is a blank in the contract form. So if they're in the middle of negotiating counter offer, another counter offer, and they want to uh, put some detailed facts, okay, that impacts the decision of both sides, yet there is no addendum to do it with, and there is space to put it, it type it into the special provisions, then we will type it in there. Or we add an exhibit form if it's a longer statement, okay, that is acceptable. Material facts regarding title must be disclosed despite any adverse consequences. So we're just reading uh, those material facts, okay, that are available. And an encumbrance like that can show up to the public on recorded documents. So we know of it, we disclose it. We're not interpreting it uh, or advising them of anything illegal. We're just stating a fact of an encumbrance, a cloud on the title. We can't say, well, you know what? Oh, that encumbrance, oh, it'll probably be removed. It won't be an issue. Well, for right now, it is an issue. It's creating a problem for the lender and for the buyer. All right. All right. Number four. I'm wearing out really quick, y'all. Um, which of the following is a violation of license laws as they relate to contracts? Okay. Which one is a violation to license laws? 
A, using a committee form under certain circumstances. B, entering language onto a contract clause blank that defines what a tenant can or cannot do if the landlord does not make a timely security improvement. B, C, refusing to, uh, to load language from, a pro from promulgated contract A into promo co promulgated contract B for the sale for the sake of efficiency. D, advising a buyer that a contract is legally buy, binding. Okay, so using a committee form. Well, there is a committee that creates them, right? Entering language onto a contract clause. Hmm. Even though it's a contract clause blank that defines what a tenant or can or cannot do. Okay. These are things that should be there already. Um, or it has to have an amendment or addendum or have an attorney include it. C, refusing to load language from one contract to another. Well, you know, now they uh, populate from one contract to another. Advising a buyer that a contract is legally binding. Yes, the answer is B, entering language. So licensees may not define the rights of a principle in a contract, such as what a tenant can do given a landlord default. That has to be explained within the contract or the lease agreement already. Committee forms may be used with commission permission. Advising clients that contracts are legally binding is a required duty, not an option, because contracts are legally binding. All right, that was B, right? So make sure you keep an eye on me typing the correct answer. All right, number uh, five. During the course of a transaction, the licensee must advise clients of various circumstances where legal counsel should be consulted. In which of the following scenarios should the licensee recommend that the buyer obtain legal counsel? A, oops, the show. We're on 15. So A, licensee is, uh, okay, so in which of the following scenarios should the licensee recommend that the buyer obtain legal counsel? So recommend to a, a client to go to a, an attorney. A, the licensee is selling her own property and has just hired an attorney to represent her. B, a transaction involving several promulgated contracts. C, a contract for D transaction involving several non-standard contingencies or D a buyer is about to place an offer on a property where the previous residents had AIDS. So in which should the realtor recommend the buyer obtain legal counsel? All right, so far we have B and C and C. And yes, the answer is C. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, C. A contract for deed transaction involving several non-standard contingencies, okay? So there's conditions that in the sale of the property are not the norm, okay? So the, so the first one, anybody said A? No, everybody answered. Okay, there was one B, and I'll go in there in a minute. All right, so B says, uh, in which of the following scenarios should the licensee recommend that the buyer obtain legal counsel? Quote, during the course of a transaction, the licensee must advise clients of various circumstances where legal counsel should be consulted. So the licensee is advising their client, which they have a um, uh, agency agreement with, right? The first one says a licensee is selling her own property and has just hired an attorney to represent her. Okay, so 
that's who she's hiring. So she is selling her own property. The buyer is representing themselves. So, you know, they can go and get their own attorney. So that one is not one in which the scenario licensee should recommend that the buyer obtain legal counsel. B, there, there's already an attorney involved. So that attorney uh, will be uh, paid by both sides, okay, to close the transaction. That attorney can consult, okay, that client. They're not representing them. They're just uh, facilitating the close. And they're an attorney, right? So they can ask legal questions. Uh, B, a transaction involving several promulgated contracts. Well, that is what we do in the norm. So whenever we're doing a purchase and sale contract, there's going to be multiple uh, promulgated documents involved. C, a contract for D transaction involving several non-standard contingencies. So what's a contract for deed? A contract for deed, right, is when a seller is selling the property directly to a buyer, but they're going to keep legal title until the buyer uh, executes the payments of, uh, executes paying the balance, right? So, and there's some out of the ordinary contingencies involved. Yes, better get advice, legal advice. So D, a buyer is about to place an offer on a property where the previous resident had AIDS? No, okay? There's no legal counsel required on that. We don't have to disclose that somebody died by AIDS, okay? That is a natural cause, all right? Okay, so we're going to call it short on state. Remember, I am doing uh, less state questions now because you actually have less state questions on the actual exam. So a little bit more national and fewer state questions because then we go through them really fast. Okay, and there aren't enough books by this author until they issue a new one. All right, so uh, any questions? And in addition to that, you can tell I don't look the best, okay? I'm not feeling the best. Uh, any questions so far on what we just reviewed, either national, actually preferably state, because that's the topic that we were on. And so this particular book, okay, you are able to, uh, it's listed on the description below, and you can purchase some of those books, okay, through Amazon. Uh, I listed four books, one of them that's free on the internet. You can Google it and download it, or you can purchase your own copy from Amazon and it may come with its own CD. And that is an old book that it's excellent. Texas Real Estate uh, Sales Exam, fourth edition. The other books are by authors, okay? And they publish books um, whenever there are state changes, state law changes, and they republish them, those you can buy on the internet. And I like those books because the questions uh, give answers that are explained. And each of the books has their own review section. They don't all have vocabulary included. The first book that's free on the internet, okay, it's been there for years, you can download it and uh, and have your own copy. You know, whoever put it up there, well, it's been running around for years. The others are published and for sale on Amazon. You click my link, you'll support my channel by using my link to buy them. And it doesn't cost you any extra. It just takes you to amazon.com. I have an affiliation with Amazon, so I'm an affiliate member. So anytime somebody purchases material using my link, whether it's a book or anything else that you purchase within 24 hours, Amazon will uh, pay me, reward me with an affiliation fee, a little percentage, okay? And I just implemented this a couple months ago and I already made eight bucks, okay? Because a few people have bought some of the books. And I recommend books that I evaluate, that I find very useful, to explaining the answers versus just giving you a letter answer. And they have a summary about the material. They have math and, you know, all the different topics that you're going to prepare to study with on the exam, national and state. And I always advise practice and practice lots of questions and answers till you get them 100%, not just 80 but go for 100%. The higher score you get, 
the easier the actual exam will be because the actual exams are harder. And repeat and study your vocabulary. If you do these exam questions and you miss a lot, go and check to see why you missed them. Could it be because of vocabulary or because you didn't understand the question? If you didn't understand the question, you know, look for little keywords, review my videos, review other channel videos that are really good out there. There's different instructors or different tutors, different realtors, okay, that do it. And, uh, and so prep agent is one, the real estate wizard, the ninja real estate school or something like that. Uh, there are a lot of really good channels that actually will review topics Okay, and a lot of vocabulary. They don't focus necessarily on Texas. That is one of the areas in addition to national that I focus on. Okay, and so, you know, be careful on the books that you buy or who you buy from. Prep books are the excellent one. They're a summary of the six courses that you took. If for some reason you do not pass your exams after three attempts, you must take in the state of Texas, repeat one course for the national, one course for the state. And typically best to do the principles one and principles two. Okay. If your year expires, then you'll have to renew, reapply with TREC for another year. Okay. And continue taking your exams. Hi, Tanya. So we are just ending the class. And of course, I too am a realtor and dealing with clients, okay? Not as many in the past. However, uh, I still am practicing real estate. All right. If no further questions, thank you, Cindy. Appreciate it. Yeah, me too. I hope I feel better. I'll be doing some more rest. I feel like I'm getting uh, a little bit of a fever here. Uh, you're very welcome, Gina. Thank you all of you for attending for showing up, letting me know that, hey, you really want this, okay? And not giving up on yourself. Never, never, never give up on yourself because who else do you have but you, right? Moi. And if you're ever down and out, need some encouragement, some motivation, hey, give me a jingle, all right? Send me a text and let's chat. I'll prep you up, okay? I'm, I'm all about encouraging positive mental attitude, you know, a mindset to help you focus on the task at hand to pass your real estate exam. All right. Until next time. Love you all. Thank you, Angela. I will invest in the book. I hope you get plenty of rest. Thank you. I am going to drink a lot of water and chill now. All right. Thanks you all. Until next time. Bye. Catch you later.